So yeah, the world's a bit of a mess. There are thousands of conflicts happening right now that are producing millions of refugees, forcing them to flee their homes and flee their lives to surrounding countries. In July, there were 22.5 million refugees in the world. 75% of them are under UN mandate, which means the United Nations is responsible for providing emergency assistance to them. They're also, they also have to provide plans and strategies for repatriation, integration, and asylum. Every 20 minutes, one person is forcibly displaced from their home. They remain displaced for five to 25 years. This presents an insurmountable challenge for UNHCR. With the increasing number of conflicts and the extended durations, they have to design settlements in order to accommodate the influx of refugees. We're experiencing the largest crisis ever right now. Host nations are at a breaking point. UNHCR hosts over three million refugees in settlements and camps throughout the world. Since the South Sudanese Civil War began, there have been two million refugees in over three years. They're fleeing their homes to Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and the Central African Republic. But Uganda is hosting over one million refugees from that crisis. 800,000 of those one million have arrived in the past 15 months. To put that into perspective, the United States absorbs 50,000 refugees each year, and they cap it. This is impacting Uganda's population by 3%. That's huge. They're still arriving at about a rate of 3,000 per month. Bidi Bidi is the largest refugee camp in the world. It's home to 300,000 people. At its peak, it's a, it was absorbing 80,000 in one month and about 7,000 people each day. These people have traveled over 200 miles with all of their belongings fitting in one bag. Half of them are under the age of 18. What happens is they arrive at these refugee settlements and they're exhausted, they're hurt, they're starving, and then they have to wait. UNHCR, their goal is to have people wait no longer than 24 hours to be registered and documented. In times like this, that extends to a period of three to five days. Anything greater than five days, they run the risk of people dying in line. The challenge is that the UN needs to develop a plan in three to five days that will provide food, shelter, and first aid to all of the arriving refugees. So what's the fastest way to do that, right? You can look at an ideal situation in your head, and that ideal situation might look something like having a host community provide a vacant, isolated section of land the largest, you know, in order to accommodate the largest amount of people in the shortest amount of time using the fewest amount of resources. What that results in, however, is a large endless grid of numbered plots, identical in shape and size and function. You have to understand, these refugees, this isn't their war, and they have no sentence to serve, but they're being placed in settlements that resemble prisons and military bases. It's not dignified. It's part of the UN mandate to provide dignity to each and every refugee. These settlements are also not sustainable. The camps have been designed this way for decades because it's fast and repeatable, but it's not sustainable. When repatriation isn't possible, refugees can remain in these camps for generations. 
Institutionalized refugees are dependent on UNHCR for food and water and clothing and supplies. This isn't a sustainable approach. The refugees have nowhere to go. They're not getting integrated. They're not using their skills. Their lives are still in flux. Even if a conflict is resolved and a camp becomes abandoned, it becomes a burden on that host community and it becomes a burden on the environment. UNHCR needed a strategic shift. It needed its layouts to respond to the cultural makeup of arriving refugees. It needed to look at the demographics of who was arriving. Are they women and children? Are they single men? Did they come from rural areas? Do they grow their own food? Did they come from cities like Aleppo, where they were software engineers or senior consultants? They need to view these settlements as extensions of a host community. This allows them to have this lasting positive impact on refugees and the host community itself. UNHCR and the UN is flush with cash. They have an operating budget of $7 billion. The cost to produce a refugee camp is upwards of 400, sometimes $600 million. So what does it look like if we start inserting this cash into a more, into the host community? And having that cash provide an investment to develop schools and health facilities, develop energy, and transportation infrastructure? What does it look like when we develop that settlement into a more rural community and we match the population density to those of the surrounding villages? What if UNHCR invested in that particular marketplace that they could have a shared, integrated interaction with one another? What do these camps look like now? They're not grids, they're not barracks. They look like integrated communities with the host community. This strategy for refugee settlement design provides refugees with a lot of dignity. The host communities are willing to absorb more refugees if UNHCR invests in their infrastructure. However, there's some roadblocks. It takes a lot more time to analyze that, convict, that existing makeup. And when I spoke earlier about how refugees have to wait in line at a reception center, is it really worth risking somebody's life in order to produce a more sustainable approach? UNHCR needed a solution. They needed tools to analyze the sites faster. They needed to plan their settlements smarter. And they needed to reduce the long-term impact of settlements on host communities. They needed to see their data in the context of a geographic environment. Q Autodesk Foundation, right? It's kind of what they do. <laughs> so Autodesk Foundation provided UNHCR with over 140 seats of Infrastructure Design Suite Ultimate and InfraWorks 360. And don't worry, guys, they've all been moved to collections, so they've been upgraded. Uh, two years ago, at this conference, I got to meet Irene Mutevu. Um, UNHCR had invited her to attend to learn more about the software that she was implementing, and uh, she was a bit overwhelmed. <laughs> there was a lot of, of classes she attended, and she knew the solution was there to provide better solutions for these refugee settlements. She just couldn't see how it fit in with her workflow. So my colleague came up to me and said, hey, somebody, uh, somebody needs to talk to you about Civil 3D. Can you, can you go help them out? Like, yeah, 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 it was Friday morning. Like, it was like the sunset of AU. Everything was kind of breaking down. And I had no idea that this conversation was really going to change the outlook of how I viewed the world. It, it made everything smaller. It made everything kind of make sense for me. So I thanked her for that. After three hours, we developed an approach to analyze existing site conditions. One week later, I got a call from Geneva, you know, those fun international numbers that show up on your cell phone. And uh, she wanted me to help her create a deployment for these 141 seats. Uh, there was an escalating uh, crisis in Syria, an escalating crisis in Nigeria. And she's like, no, the solution's there. We can, we can do it. They can figure it out. And I tried to explain to her that that's kind of like 
providing a fleet of Ferraris to a driver's ed class. It's just, there's a lot of information there that they're not going to be able to use. So we started a pilot program. And this pilot program, we were very concerned about the process of the development of a refugee settlement. So the most important piece when you're determining, you know, and, and you have to do this very fast, the most important piece you need to be concerned about is how much usable land you have available. This usable land dictates how many refugees you can absorb. An individual refugee requires approximately 500 square feet. And that 500 square feet just isn't where they sleep or eat. That 500 square feet incorporates recreation facilities or a school or the um, sanitation requirements, spacing for fire protection. UNHCR actually has an app for that. They, <laughs> on their phone, they can punch in how many refugees they're expecting and it will say what, how large of a land area they need to look for. So the usable land area is the entire property with all of the undevelopable areas removed. They have to determine, again, how many of these refugees can be accommodated. So we used Mahama Rwanda, uh, which is a, a, was a recently completed refugee camp for our proof of concept. We collected all of the existing conditions information from UNISAT, ASTER, we had a local surveyor provide topographic information. And we built an existing condition surface and overlaid all of this uh, GIS information on it in under an hour. <laughs> so UNHCR was like, well, that's, that's great. I'm gonna add, I'm, let's do more with it. So they started asking questions. You know, Jessica, can it, uh, can, it, can it absorb flooding information? Can we show how, when the rain falls, how we can prevent tents wiping out from down the, down the slopes? What does that look like? How do we get that? How do we extract that for, and, and calculate the usable land area? So we did. We used the flow path analysis, we looked at HECRAS, um, HECRAS modeling, and we were able to determine under certain rainfall conditions how much area is going to be taken up by the intermittent streams. And you don't build tents there. They looked at steep slopes. Every single refugee settlement is pretty much constructed without the use of heavy machinery. And think about that for a minute. It's hundreds of thousands of people hundreds of hectares of land, no heavy machinery. You're building roads, you're using shovels, you're using manpower. So when people arrive to the refugee settlements, they are sometimes responsible for leveling their own plot. So we did mass hall diagrams, making sure that individual plots could be transferred with the use of a shovel and a wheelbarrow. We could balance our cut and fills. And then there were some areas that just were completely unbuild unbuildable due to the steep slope. So the steep slope analysis that we provided, we were able to extract out the areas that were greater than 12% and determined that they were unbuildable. We also incorporated conceptual design tools. So we planned the layout using the cultural knowledge of the refugees and provided areas for farming, schools, recreation. We overlaid the entire thing in InfraWorks and then created a model. We were able to visualize and simulate different site conditions. Um, and then we, we sat back and we took a look at it and realized we, we had a proof of concept at that point. We had a model. We had a model that answered their questions. We had a model that could deliver all of the information they needed to determine how they were going to design these refugee settlements. Then we had to look at process. So could this process be taught? We implemented training. UNHCR hosted 16 site planners and shelter officers in Geneva. We had two days of classroom training where we exposed many of these users to InfraWorks and Civil 3D for the first time. Two days. When I teach a class on InfraWorks, it's typically three days long just to learn the basics. These site planners sat through two days of me showing them a process in InfraWorks and Civil 3D of how they could get their work done faster. Then we moved on to the scenario-based training in the Swiss Alps. My job sucks sometimes, guys. <laughs> so we went to the Swiss Alps and uh, they were given a scenario and this particular scenario was to accommodate 30,000 refugees in a host community and a potential site for a refugee settlement. It was on the side of a mountain. 
And uh, I said, oh, come on, you know, this is even steeper than the Mahama site. And I had a site planner say, this is what we were given in Afghanistan. They have to be able to accommodate and, and use, with what, use what they're given. So they did a four-hour site walk. They gathered a bunch of information. We had a lot of GIS information about the host community, vacant buildings, school capacities, where did the train go, how close were the health facilities, and we overlaid it all in an InfoWorks model. We used an EB, uh, a fixed wing uh, UAV, to fly the site in order to collect point cloud information for the topography. And we analyzed the village. In three days, the UNHCR site planners were able to develop a strategy for planning, constructing, and decommissioning a refugee settlement. So we completed our proof of concept. We had a model that was valuable enough to dictate how many refugees they could absorb, and we had a process that we could deploy so that they could implement it in the field. So they implemented it. There's probably 50 people at UNHCR that are currently using these tools to design refugee settlements as we speak. In Bangladesh and Uganda, it's predominantly where they're being used. They're using these tools to implement new strategy for dignified, sustainable settlements. And it's taking 30 to 50% less time than the traditional workflows of designing barracks. They're building the largest world's refugee camp right now in Bangladesh, in Cox Bazar. It'll be large enough to provide homes for 800,000 people. 4,000 people are arriving per day. That means with the new strategies that they've implemented and the new process, they're able to accommodate 1,500 more people through registration that were 1,500 people more than if they had implemented the traditional workflows. This crisis in, or this emergency in Bangladesh has been going on since July, which means that since July, they've been able to accommodate and move 300,000 people faster through the registration process, which means those 300,000 people have spent less time in the registration line and have spent more time developing a new life where they feel safe, secured, and dignified. So thank you.